Hi, Jesse. How are you? Good, good. Very good. <laughs> good. Okay. Well, I'm good. Um, hello. Welcome to Atheist Republic Discussions. I'm Susanna, and today we have a very special guest, my friend Jesse. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is pretty fun. Um, I was thinking about how we first became friends, and you hit me up on Instagram, and it's crazy to think about like how different our lives are like since then, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know how I actually came across you. I think you might have your Instagram handle might have been under an Atheist Republic video or something. Um, and yeah, I, I followed you and I think messaged you and, uh, and yeah, it was so different. My name wasn't Jesse, my name's Yusuf, and you weren't in the position you're in now with AR. So yeah, we've come a long way. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's like, I was elected to the board, you're going to Africa, like, you have a whole ass new name, like, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's so exciting. Look at us go. Um, yeah, so I wanted to have you on today um, because you have a really interesting story. And you're also a bit of an ex-Muslim activist and um, very passionate one at that. And, um, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted, I had to get you on, especially because you're leaving soon. Um, so I guess one of the most obvious places to start is the beginning. So can you tell us where you were born and where you grew up? Yeah, I was born in a town called Hemel Hempstead, which is in Hertfordshire, which is in the UK. It's just outside of North West London. Um, and, uh, yeah, born to an English and Irish mother and an Egyptian father and, uh, lived in the UK all my life. Uh, well, I, I've gone abroad since being an adult. Um, but yeah, born and raised in the UK. Nice. And when you were at an early age, there was a very dramatic event that happened to say the least. And I think that kind of set in motion a lot of your um, criticism <laughs> later in life. Um, so basically you were abducted back to the Middle East as a kid. Yeah, Correct. so let's get into that. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, this whole event uh, would probably take like a good, hour two hours to, to cover and it, really it's my mum's story to tell but you know I know 99% of it so obviously I, I can tell it um but basically my mum and my dad had been divorced uh for not for long and so I was living with my mum and my sister who's only 11 months younger than me so this was 1999 I was four my sister was three and uh, one Friday in March 1999, my dad knocked on our door and said, can the kids stay over at mine for the weekend? And this was quite normal. So my mom said, yeah, sure. Uh, we packed our little weekend bags and we went to his car and we thought we were going to his house, which is, well, was 20 minutes away in Buckinghamshire. But we actually went straight to Heathrow Airport and he had everything planned out. He had our Egyptian passports ready. Uh, he had the flights booked and everything. And we got on a flight to Cairo. Um, and, and obviously my, you know, my mom had no idea of this. Uh, so the weekend finished and she went to my, she was calling my dad's house and no answer. She knocked on the door, no answer. And so she, you know, she worried and she kind of told a few friends like, um, you know, their dad's not here, what's going on? And it was my auntie, my mum's sister, who said, I think you should try phoning the airports because you're not gonna wanna hear this, but uh, kidnappings or abductions to the Middle East are quite common. And my mum had never thought of that before. Uh, my dad had shown no inclination of 
doing something like that. Um, mm. You know, they it turned into a, a bad marriage for my mom, and uh, he was violent and uh, just a bad husband, and they divorced. But he never threatened to take us away or anything like that. Anyway, my mum phoned all the London airports and when you know she got through to someone at Heathrow and she kind of had to play the game and she just said, I just want to check that my kids, Yusuf, my name is Yusuf then, Yusuf and my sister have gotten their uh, flight safely to Cairo. And the lady on the other end very calmly said, yeah, they landed about two hours ago. And my mum says she just kind of fell to the floor crying um, and, oh and that was the start of it all. That, oh my gosh, I can, I like literally can't even imagine. Um, and so obviously like it's probably an even longer story to talk about how you got back, but the state had to get involved, the embassies had to get involved and how long were you in Egypt total? We were there for just shy of three months. Um, mm. So I think it was about 10 and a half weeks uh, or 11 weeks. And yeah, the, the British police couldn't really do anything overseas or anything of significance. Um, so my mum sort of went down various different avenues of help. She tried absolutely everything. She went on live TV. Uh, I think it was either ITV or Channel 4, I can't remember which. And, um, you know, she she had various different lawyers and solicitors, and um, which was all very expensive. She had so many friends helping her out. Um, I can't, she wouldn't have done it without some of her friends who, who are now my friends. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, 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 I always miss out key kind of details. Um, uh, and if you want to go into it at length, I'm more than happy to do that. But basically, uh, she, so much happened, but she, there was a, he had phoned England. He had phoned my mom and said, uh, if you come looking for your kid, we know that you know they're here. If you come looking for them, you will never see them again and we'll go underground. They were his words. Um, which would have probably been very easy for my dad to do. Um, so my mum was under the impression that, you know, she's never going to see her kids again. And she said she cried every day for, for that time, but she didn't give up. And um, when we actually came back, so so much happened, but she got a phone call from her solicitor. Uh, and, and my mum was driving and the solicitor said, pull over. So my mum pulled over and she said, he's landed and he's been arrested on the spot um, at Heathrow Airport. So the British police had been you know, informed that if this man, uh, I think I've named him in other podcasts, but I, I won't name him. If this man matching this description lands at this airport or any airport, you know, phone the police straight away. And, and that's what happened. So he was then in custody in Hemel Hempstead Police Station um, and my mum got on the next flight out there to, to Cairo. She, we had been handed over to the British Embassy by our grandparents, so my dad's parents, um, because they had received a call saying that their son has been arrested in the UK and if they don't hand us over, they will go down with him. Uh, I don't know the exact name of the, what the charge would have been, but something like assisting abduction. Um, so they took us to the embassy and the embassy put us in a hotel. My mom landed in Cairo, got to the embassy. They took her to the hotel and um, the lady from the embassy said, right, your kids are in this room. Um, and my mom said, I can't, I can't go in there. I'm going to go in my room. They had another room for my mum. And in hindsight, my mum looks back and thinks that this lady knew what she was doing because she said, no, you must see your kids now. And so my mum came into our room and we were asleep. And she said that she sat on the end of the bed playing with our hair. And I woke up half asleep and said, mummy, can you take me to the toilet? 
And so she took me to the toilet, I came back, the same thing happened with my sister. And it was as if nothing happened. Um, and then we all woke up, we got on a plane back to England and, and then here we are. And my mum says that for, you know, from that moment where we woke up with her uh, for the whole plane journey and a month or two after we got back to the UK, we didn't let go of her hand like once. We, we couldn't go to the toilet without her. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't remember this, uh, but you know, I've, I've heard it from my mum. So uh, yeah, I've missed out so many details there, um, but it, it's, uh, I get lost with it all because it's such a big, you know, episode. It's an odyssey, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it's interesting and important to highlight because I haven't been able to find any statistics on like how common this is, but it's not uncommon. Um, I have an ex who was also abducted as a child, um, except, well, I, I'm not at will to like disclose details, but he didn't return until he was an early teenager. Wow. Um, and I have lots of friends who were either threatened with abduction or, um, cause I, I consider it abduction if you're being forcibly taken to another country, even if it's, you know, like you're fully cognizant the whole time, you know, like technically like Yasmin Muhammad was abducted back to Egypt. I mean, she was deserted, but it was under a false pretense. So I consider that abduction. And, um, so many cases and it, it's so tricky with minors because um i have to be careful with what i say um basically your best legal option is legal emancipation um because of your parental guardianship and um it's really scary that um a lot of youth are threatened with this when they start to show dissent, you know, within their family. Um, or maybe not even dissent, just like wanting to further your own education or um, be expressive in your own ways, which I guess given the household can be very dissenting. Um, and so thank you for like sharing your story because that's obviously something um, very dramatic to say the least um yeah. what well, on the statistics so my uh, my mom i don't know the statistics of today but at the time my mum was told by the foreign office that only two mums from the west or from the uk so it's not totally clear only two mums in the last four years have got their kids back from a middle eastern kidnapping uh so it was, I think someone gave her like, you've got a one to 2% chance of, of getting your kids back. So like, it was, yeah, it's a miracle. <laughs> oh my God, just like hearing about it, I can't even imagine. Um, yeah, so did your dad ever state an explicit motivation for this? So he, so when that happened uh, and he, he got arrested and my mum got us back, he went to prison for a short amount of time here in the UK and then went back to Egypt. I think my mum had a restraining order on him so he, he you know, couldn't see us anyway, but he went back to Egypt and I didn't see him for nine years. And then he came back to the UK when I was 13 and, um, uh, Oh God, I've forgotten your question. I was on a, what was your, what was your question? I was, um, what, what do you think or has ever, uh, has your dad ever given you insight into what was his motivation for abducting you back to Egypt? Yeah, yeah, so when I, I questioned him on it when I was about, I don't know, 14, 15 or 16 in his house here in the UK. And he said that he didn't want us to grow up as English people in England, uh, because well, he wanted us to grow up in Egypt as Muslims. Um, you know, it's the duty of every Muslim father to raise your kids as, as Muslim. Um, and, and I'm sure that that probably applies to 
from probably every religion, you know, um, I know that Christians certainly want their kids to uh, follow the same faith as them. I don't know if it's written in the Bible, but um, yeah, so he, and then he also says that he wanted us to see his dad who was dying. Um, but that doesn't hold up for me because he could have just told my mum that and said, right, I'm going to take the kids to Egypt for a week or something. So um, I think he was clutching at straws there, just trying to think of an excuse. But yeah, it, bottom line is he didn't want us to grow up in England as non-Muslims. And he actually predicted to my mum, he said that if the kids are raised in England, your daughter will get pregnant as a teenager and your kids will go nowhere. And lo and behold, he was right. Uh, well, in one sense, my sister was... <laughs> My sister you did didn't go pregnant. nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so my sister got pregnant at 15 and had her baby, my beautiful niece, at 16. And when that happened, um, that was a very kind of traumatic time for me uh, for many reasons. But my dad put all the blame on me. Um, and and he, he said to my mom, told you so, told you your daughter will get pregnant, blah, 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 blah. Um, and yet put all the blame on me. He said, how could you let your sister get pregnant? Look at your younger brother. He would never let his sisters get pregnant. You're not a real man. Um, so, yeah. That's what's so strange to me. Um, I don't know if strange is the right word. Um, this whole idea of, I mean, it comes from male guardianship, right? Like letting your sister get pregnant. Like, what are you supposed to do about it? You're not her guardian. You're her brother. Like, have you ever seen, um, oh my God, I've sent you a couple of videos from Dawa Man before. Have you seen the video of um, Imran Ibn Masur um, doing street interviews? Where he's talking to men and yeah. he's like, would you let, would you let your sister have a one night stand yeah. <laughs> and all the men are like yeah like and yeah. there's this brazilian guy he's my favorite he's like yeah, yeah it's free love man <laughs> yeah he's and, like dude we're brazilian we, we fuck all the time what are you talking about <laughs> and and imran's like wow like wow yeah as if, as if he like was wasn't expecting those answers. Like, you know, he's not in Saudi Arabia. What, what did he expect? I don't get it. But yeah, that I mean, videos like that are are golden. You know, and I I, I often say this. I reply to Yasmin Mohammed when she tweets a lot of this stuff on on Twitter. Um, they just put the criticism on a plate for us. It like we don't have to go digging and you know flicking through old history books to criticize Islam. They like. It's just easy for us. It's, it's, it's presented every single day, which is great. But Yeah, I think I retweeted that video from XMNA and just said, like, <laughs> Dawa Man produces yet another Super, <laughs> Super Bowl-worthy <laughs> advertisement for apostasy. <laughs> like, they really, yeah, do the work for us. But it gets, so when your dad came back into your life as an early teenager, he started to bring these new influences on you about what it means to be a man in his faith, right? And so to an extent that is an expectation of control or guardianship over your sister, um, well, they would say guardianship and protection, but in reality it's control. <laughs> yeah. um, and what are some of the other messages that you got from your dad about what it means to be a man in Islam? So, well, well, when I met, when I first met him, when I was 13, literally met him after nine years and he was my superhero dad because my mum didn't raise me kind of speaking badly of him. Um, she, Good. You know, yeah, it was amazing of her. She just wanted me to form my own opinion as and when I meet him. Anyway, first time I met him, again, when I was 13, we hugged and then he kind of pushed me away and, and looked at my earrings and said, are you gay? Um, and basically made me take my earrings out um, 
so some of the other messages he said, you know, he instilled a huge amount of homophobia into me. Um, you know, I said this, I was in a, on a podcast the other day. Growing up in England, or certainly me and my friends, uh, in my school, everyone used to say gay jokes. You know, it, it was a very common thing to be like, to use the word gay boy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And although I am uh, very uh, non-politically correct, or I am politically <laughs> correct, um, I, I look back now and think that, that you know, that wasn't cool. Um, but I wouldn't have consider myself a homophobic person back then but then when I met my dad he you know he would tell me gay people are mentally ill they all need to be put on an island and killed um yeah and uh and I you know out of fear of him I just accepted it and, and I just saw him as literally this god uh he was like Allah in human form for me uh he was also, I mean, probably there are other factors as to why that was the case, but I'm very sporty and he achieved a lot he, uh, in sport. He was an Olympic wrestler. Um, so I just totally like couldn't see past what he said. What he said was right. And on top of the homophobia, it was a lot of uh, anti-Semitism. He would like always talk about how all the Jews need to be killed. All the Jews need to be gathered up and inshallah, God will call us to kill the Jews one day. I'm waiting for the day that Allah calls me to go and kill the Jews. Um, there so, goes the monetization and prioritization of this video. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding, it happens every time. <laughs> yeah, um, so, and, and then the sexism as well, you know, so the homophobia, the anti-Semitism and the, the misogyny and sexism, you know, he, he would just talk about women like they were objects, slaves, you know, animals, um, he had literally no shame in, in saying a woman's job is to be in the kitchen, provide the food and make the babies. Um, and it's funny because sometimes I find myself, uh, even now, kind of defending my dad at times because what I saw, he did treat, you know, so he's got a, a wife now, um, a, a new Egyptian wife, this is his fourth wife, um, and he treats her well. Uh, he, he is kind to her. Um, I've never seen him hit her or anything like that. But, you know, I feel so sorry for her. She's got no friends in England. Um, she, she hasn't learned English. She, she can't leave the house and get a job. She just slaves away in the kitchen. Um, and, you know, my dad gets in from work. He's, he's a big guy, but he's... he's plumps himself down on the sofa, clicks his fingers, and she unties his shoelaces. Um, you know, that is what it's like. And mm -hmm. I've never asked her how she feels about that, but she seems fine with it, which is the sad thing. Yeah, I went certain... off a few different tangents there, sorry. No, it's good. Yeah, it, it says a lot about the nature of a relationship when you see that, right? when you see what the expectation is without any words need to, needing to be spoken. Um, so that's very interesting, very telling. So your dad came back into your life when you were an early teenager and um, you had younger siblings from his side um, through different marriages and stuff. And then he started to introduce you more seriously to Islam because your mom was non-religious. And um, it makes sense to me that you would still have this deep yearning and admiration for your father because you were a young boy who had been without his father most of his life. Like, that's natural. Um, and so, latching on to the messages that he's giving you about what it means to be a man, this man that you came from, you know, makes a lot of sense to me. And so how did he start to introduce Islam into your life? Well, he, he would, well, he would talk about it, you know, um, kind of, he, he almost couldn't have a conversation with me without, 
somehow bringing the Quran into it. Um, you know, it, he could literally be talking about grass or, or football and he would somehow bring Islam or the Quran into it. Um, he would point at my younger siblings and say, look at them, Yusuf, they're praying. Allah loves them that, you know, um, because I didn't join in with the praying. Uh, I, I just didn't feel comfortable. I didn't know the words. Um, I watched them do it every day, but just kind of didn't join in for the first few years. And then when I was about 16, 17, I think my dad realized, right, he's getting a bit older now. We really have to knuckle down and, and make him Muslim. Um, and so he, you know, would often say, come to mosque, come to mosque. And I would find excuses not to. I'd, I'd lie and say I'm, I'm playing football when I wasn't. Um, but it was just kind of through demonstration and, and just basically saying, you don't want to be like these English people. You said they're, they're like dogs. All they do without Allah, all they do is eat shit fuck. And, and you don't want to be like that. You're, you're better than that. Um, so it was, it was kind of under, it was never forced. Um, uh, you know, I have had it, my journey out of Islam has been so easy compared to the likes of Yasmin Mohammed or Ayan Hisseli and or many other ex-Muslim friends that I've got. Um, yeah, so I, I was never forced, um, into it. It was just kind of out of, he used humiliation as well. You know, he, he would make me feel like just a, a piece of shit basically um not a real man you know he always would say you need to be a real man you know real man pray and and i wanted to be a real man whatever that was um so yeah i don't know if that I mean, the question. no it does it, it's it's interesting to hear from the perspective of ideals of masculinity being intertwined um with faith um also, I just love when you do impressions of your dad's accent. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, there was, there was pressure in, inside that relationship to act a certain way. There was belittling um, inside that relationship to act a certain way and to um, demonstrate faith in a certain way. And then you actually became more willfully involved in the faith when you reached college, right? Yeah. So when I was 18, I earned myself a soccer scholarship. So if you hear me say football, I mean soccer. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. So I got a soccer scholarship to go to university in America, um, Georgia State Perimeter College in, in Atlanta. And um, it was there that I met uh, loads of young, cool Muslims. Um, I became part, I, I became a member of the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. Um, I would go to meetings and um, I was going to mosque. And it was actually the, the, the group that really introduced me to the MSA and, and the, the kind of the, the faith were a group of young girls that were when I say young, they were about my age, 18, 19, 20. And one was Algerian and two were Palestinian and, and there was a larger group as well. And um, two of them were hijabi, one of them wasn't. And they just seemed so cool to me. And I thought, oh, because where I grew up in England, I didn't grow up in central London. So it was a majority white middle-class town. There was no Islamic influence, no, is that no Islamic culture, uh, no mosque in my town. So um, I just had my dad and I, I, although I loved him, I thought he was a bit out of fashion and, you know. So when I saw these young Muslims, um, you know, happy, I thought, wow, okay, like you can be Muslim and young and cool. Because I think also, you know, I would, um, when I was younger, like 15, 16, 17, I, uh, I didn't, I was kind of embarrassed of my, that side of my family, the, the Muslim side of my family. I don't know if uh, like, it's because I was in a majority white town and I'm not saying that all my friends are racist, definitely not. 
Um, but it was just, I don't know, something really different. You know, um, my dad's wife wearing a hijab. I, I remember times where I didn't want to be seen um, with them. And then, yeah, it all changed when I went to America. I, I'm in this big city, Atlanta, and there's all these young, cool Muslims. So I thought, right, I'll dive straight in. And yeah, started going to mosque and uh, became a part of the, the MSA. Um, and, and that's how I kind of thought, okay, cool. I, I can actually really be a Muslim now. And I remember phoning my dad and saying, dad, I'm going to mosque. Um, I put him on the phone to this Palestinian girl and he was so happy that I was, you know, finding um, the faith. Interesting. Do you feel like when you started to get more involved in the faith, you started to receive more approval from your father that you were seeking? 100%. It made me feel so good because um, I've always had this, well, now there's no relationship, but I always had this broken relationship with my dad, it, you know, and um, now, yeah, now was, was, the time where he said, oh, okay, I'm, I'm proud of you, son, you know, show me pictures of the mosque, I'm really happy you're there, blah, 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 you know, so, yeah, definitely, that, that made me feel really good. I'm also just, like, cracking up, imagining you in Atlanta, because um, <laughs> you must have gotten into some trouble in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did, I, yeah, <laughs> I, had so, I had so much fun, uh, yeah. I did get into some trouble. I think I think it's kind of well documented. Um, one of the things that happened to me. Oh my god! Um, so you were in America. You found this new group of people, and it's not uncommon for people to get involved in a group, not because of the shared ideology, but because of the community. Do you think that was reflected in your experience? Like you already had a familiarity with the ideology because of your father, and then that contributed also a certain pressure and expectation and incentive to participate in that ideology. But then it sounds like in Atlanta, it was the sense of community that actually really kind of brought you in. 100%, you know, I wasn't reading the scripture saying oh this is great you know, kill jews I, you know um it, it was it was just the it was totally the community um i had other friends i had latino friends i had you know black friends non-muslim friends um that were all part of the, the soccer team and whatnot but um yeah just the fact that it was a real sense of community and belonging and you know they really welcomed me I think, you know, I hate sounding like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but I think they, this group saw in me, oh, wow, here's a cool British guy on the soccer team. Um, you know, because we, we were like, we weren't a Division One school, but, you know, I would walk into class sometimes with my soccer kind of tracksuit and people would say, oh, you're number eight on the soccer team, right? Well, like, you played a great game last night. And that's a pretty good American accent. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I think they saw me, they, they were like, right, let's get this popular guy into our group. And, and I loved it. You know, they, they, they treated me differently to everyone else. There was much more interest in me within the Muslim community than there was for other people. And I loved it, you know. <laughs> Hot commodity. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I love it. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense too, because when you're in a new country, you're kind of like in a whole new pond, like, you, and what is familiar is oftentimes like religion. Like as a Catholic, I can go into any Catholic church around the world and I will know exactly how it's going to work. Right. Yeah. Like, I'm going to know exactly when to stand up. I'm going to know exactly when to sit. Like, having that, um, that standardization, I mean, it's a franchise, right? Um, yeah. it, it's, exactly. it's, a, it's a benefit for these ideologies. Um, I guess and, it's like you get to a club and there's a dance and everyone's doing the same dance and, and you, you're like, oh, I know how to do this dance. 
and you know you feel really good about it yeah exactly like it would if I was moving to a new country it would probably help me have a sense of like control and belonging over my surroundings like oh I fit in sick like I don't I'm not stressed out and lonely um which is just an innately human thing we want to feel a sense of belongingness and not like a burden um and so how deeply were you involved in the faith so I get if you ask you know different people or my friends at the time they they would give you different answers to what I would give but I I was never an extremist I was never a fundamentalist I never prayed five times a day um, I I barely read the Quran it was just more of a, a kind of self identity thing it was like I was proud of the label I'm a Muslim and um, so yeah, I was never, you know, you see all the kind of ex-Muslims that are in our sort of community on Twitter. Uh, I was never as far in to the faith as as a lot of them were. The likes of Ali Malik and 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 whatnot, and maybe Zara Kay. I I was quite fortunate. Um, so yeah, I, I still had that freedom. You know, I I, I wasn't living in a Muslim household. Um, I, I was I was leading that double life, you know, that a lot of Muslims lead, going out and partying one weekend and doing drugs and drinking and whatever, and then the next weekend going to the mosque. And this life was just too attractive for me to to give it up. Ah, I see. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Ah, uh, wait, I had a question. Shit. Um, so I think it's, oh yeah, I remember. Um, so while you were more practicing and while you were in America, did you experience or witness any anti-Muslim bigotry? No, no, I, I witnessed racism, uh, but not any anti-Muslim uh, bigotry. No, I, I, I just didn't. No. Okay, I'm glad. Awesome. Um, and um, when you, so you got involved in this group, kind of maybe more for the community, maybe for more a sense of approval and fulfilling certain expectations, um, but you were a believer. And yeah. what opened the door to you doubting your faith? And how long did it take before you were like, so long? <laughs> yeah, so I was back in the UK at 21, 2021. And I was, you know, back in my dad's house, uh, not living there, just kind of visiting and stuff. And um, I guess I'd done a bit of maturing and growing up as, as we do. and. It was a mixture of Ricky Gervais um, and, you know, I often say he is a very easy way into atheism and logical thinking because it's hard not to like him. It's hard not to love him. Uh, I've seen, I've got Christian friends who laugh their head off at Ricky Gervais when, even when he, you know, uh, kind of disrespects religion. Um, so it was Ricky Gervais and, and the, the path of logical thinking. And then it was also, I used, I used to think about the things that my dad would say. You know, he, would, he would say things like, your mom is fucking English, bitch, blah, 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 blah. And those things, you know, as a young teenager, I just used to take it. And then when I was about 20, 21, I felt like more of a man. And I wasn't as scared of him anymore. I started to think like, oh, you can't have someone talk about your mom like that. You need to stand up to this. Um, and then it was also hearing about certain things happening around the world. So the stuff that you and I, maybe more you, uh, 
are, are doing my activism work around you know the cases like Mubarak Makbala and blasphemy laws and you know you being killed for leaving the faith. So it's a mixture of, of those three things. My dad um, providing me with material to criticise. Uh, Ricky Gervais and that kind of humorous logic, uh, and then hearing about world news and, and you know, Sharia law and things like that. Yeah. Cool. So, and what was the time period like where you were kind of like introduced to doubt and then just being more educated on the reality of blasphemy, apostasy laws? people living under Sharia law, even in the West. Um, what, what was that time period like? How, how long do you think it took? Yeah, I would say a, about a year. Um, between the ages of 20 and 21, it, it was about a year where it was like a, a battle in my own head of, right, are you going to stand up to this guy? Um, and are you going to tell him that the religion is a load of shit, or, or like, are you just going to keep it sweet for for uh, for however many more months or years? Um, so it took about a year, and then it was one conversation with my dad uh, in his house where he was talking about something. Uh, he, was, he brought Allah up or the Quran, and I just said, "Dad, I don't believe it anymore. I, I don't think Allah is real." and he lost his shit like uh and it, it didn't turn physical um but it was very loud a big argument and it ended up with me leaving the house and i didn't see him and and the family for a long time uh and so that i guess in a way made it easier because you know if you if you're having like a conversation with someone and they're putting really good points across you know any kind of sane, reasonable person will have to consider those points. But he made it so easy, you know? He was basically like, get the fuck out of my house. You know, how can you not believe Allah is real? Whereas if you put a strong case forward for it, other than saying, look around, look at the trees, look at it, look at the light, of course Allah is real. You know, <laughs> that wasn't good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, Actually, this is a little backtracking a little bit, but it kind of reminded me. When you were a teenager or growing up around him again, um, were you ever threatened with abduction again? No, no. And I actually said, I can't remember how the conversation went, but I said something, I was about 14 or 15, and I said something to my dad like, I think my mum's worried you're going to take me again. And we were laughing about it. And he sort of said, how could I take you again? Look at you, you're bigger now. I can't drag you through an airport, you know. Um, so, no, that, that was the only time that was ever kind of brought up. But he never threatened to take us again. I think I, he must have just known that he's not going to get away with it. Um, well, not if we're unwilling anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Do you, did he ever talk about how, like, your life would have been better back in Egypt? Not better because he, he, it's strange, he would disrespect England and English people so much, um, you know, very racist basically, um, yet he, he knew that England is a far better country to uh, raise your kids and grow up than Egypt. Um, he used to say how, you know, you've got to pay for school in Egypt, like even just public school. Um, you know, they weren't from the richest area of Cairo. So, no, he, he, uh, he didn't really say how my life could be better out there. What he did say was, um, Yusuf, we go to Egypt. I line up all your cousins, lots of cousins. You tell me which one you want to marry. And that's it. Easy. No problem. You marry your cousin. That, that's kind of the best thing he sold to me about Egypt, the fact that I could marry any one of my cousins that I wanted. Like, no thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, did you ever go back as a teenager, or have you ever been back since you were four? No, uh, I have not. And 
it's a it's a strange one for me because you know I've I've been in relationships where my girlfriend has said let's go to Egypt on holiday and uh, I was like I don't think I can um, for for a, a few reasons I guess but one being that you know a lot of my Egyptian family now kind of want me dead um, but to I just don't think I could go to a country like that and enjoy myself when there is so much uh, bad things happening, the, the stuff that you and I kind of talk about online. So I think if I went on there on holiday, the moment I saw, you know, perverted men, you know, treating women like shit, I, I would get in a fight. <laughs> or, um, so I don't think I can go to Egypt and, and enjoy myself. I, I'm, yeah, I'd have to go with you and, and Armin and a team and, and, you know, tackle some issues. Oh my God, I can't imagine. Um, <laughs> we get up to so much shit. Um, so you kind of touched on it briefly, but what has been the personal cost to you openly leaving Islam? Death threats, but not loads. I've got other ex-Muslim friends who get far more than I do. Um, but I've just retweeted the video I made of me drawing the Prophet Muhammad today. And uh, a couple more uh, threats have come in. Um, so there's that. There's my family completely, my Egyptian side of the family, completely kind of shutting me out, ostracizing me, and now wishing that I was dead. Um, that's really hard. My younger brother um he's he's 17 i love him so much i i raised him you know I, I taught him how to play football i taught him how to get girls i taught him how to drive and i had a phone conversation with him about a month ago really recently and uh he told me that he considers me dead he said you're not my brother i'm so glad you changed your name because i don't want anything to do with you um so that that is it's horrible, you know, I, I, I put on a brave face and, you know, I can talk about it and I'm not going to cry, but it, it really sucks, you know. It's not just my brother there, I've got twin sisters as well who are 13 and, you know, I used to take them everywhere, shopping, and, and now simply because I don't believe in this God that they believe in and I criticise it, they consider me dead. So, you know, in their eyes, if I was to die... I'd probably go as far as to say they'd be happy, but if they wouldn't be happy, they'd certainly be okay with it. Well, that's what they said. I'm so sorry. That... It's yeah. so terrible. And like the, the cost, and I'm not, that's, not, that's not the right word. Um, it can't be understated how abusive shunning is. It's, yeah. Um, it's really abusive and it's really harmful and I think people underestimate um, the toll it takes on individuals to go through ostracism yeah. um, particularly from family members um, so have you been sending you a big virtual hug <laughs> Have you been through that? Did you? How did your family react when you kind of left Catholicism? Um, oh, for me, it was different. I mean, I was not one to go along to get along as a teenager. Um, so they stopped making me go to church probably in my late teens. I mean, we'd still go for um, religious holidays. Um, yeah. but I was not a, like a cheerful participant. Um, and I let them know that, uh, <laughs> cause I was just like the worst adolescent. Um, uh, basically there, there hasn't been any, um, familial ostracism. Um, I have faced ostracism in my life from, um, various friend groups um, that was very difficult for me, um, because 
well, I mean, this is a longer story, but for a long time, I considered my friends to be my family. Like that's my chosen family. Um, and well, this is something we've talked about personally a bit. Some of what goes on in my personal life, um, for being a very open critic of Antifa and the left, um, is yeah, I've faced ostracism, um, and shunning basically for that. And, um, it's awful. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I think for you, I, I I think Americans are just much more extreme with everything, really, but um, with their faith, with with their political views. So although people have strong views here in the UK, and I have lost friends because of my political views or my uh, criticism of Islam, I have lost friends, but the ones who disagree with me will still kind of talk to me. Whereas I think in America, and like in your case, everyone's so much more extreme and they're like, oh, Susanna's not with us anymore? Well, then like, fuck Susanna. Um, that's the impression I get of America and Americans, I think. People take things very seriously here. They take it very seriously. And um, part of it is, I don't know how much of it is just kind of like a bubble for the areas that I live in. Um, I live on the West Coast, left coast, and um, within those bubbles respectively of where I grew up and where I live now, like people take it very seriously, which is a, a personal reason why I had to stay, take a step back um, because I just, um, I can't take ideologies or groups that can't face open mockery yeah if you can't openly be mocked to your face and you can't take it even in the most offensive terms like that's just not attractive to me anymore um yeah i'm i think one reason why we get along is we share a similar outrage for red lines and people trying to draw red lines around you and yeah. um over the past year, I'm just like, I can't take it anymore. I've come out guns blazing, and you have, really have, too. Which, yeah. Okay, that'll lead us into my next question, which is, what began and inspired your activism? Well, uh, you, Suzanne, are, are a big part, or a big factor in that. Um, I... So, it, you know, seeing the things that the Atheist Republic page would post, you know, I would share them and share them. And, you know, I just realized that the, the audience I was sharing them to my Facebook friends and stuff, my Instagram friends, just wasn't for them. They just weren't interested, you know. Um, and then, it, so the question is, what, what inspired my activism stuff? That, that's it? Yeah. Right? How, how did you get your start? Well, so, okay, so there's, there's two things that I was like, what inspired it? And then like, how did it actually happen? How it happened is, is uh, we connected on Instagram. You became the CEO of uh, Atheist Republic and you retweeted my TikTok videos. Uh, and, and they went kind of viral on TikTok. And, and for those who haven't seen them, they were basically just me uh, criticizing or mocking religion in general, God in general. And you found them hilarious and you retweeted them uh, on Twitter. And I like barely used Twitter, you know, uh, about five or six months ago, I had like 20 followers. I, I just used to post stuff about football really. And then, you know, it was, it was when I started, I, I read Ion Hirsi Ali's uh, book, um, uh, Infidel and um and that's what inspired me i guess along with the other things like all the stuff we've talked about about my dad and the oppression and stuff like that um and you retweeting my videos on twitter led to yasmin mohammed following me and retweeting me and kind of picking me up and i fangirled her hard i messaged her and said yasmin i love you so much um I watch your videos all the time, blah, blah, blah. 
and we got chatting and became friends and um that's how my kind of platform on twitter grew and grew to what it is now uh and has led me to now form some amazing friendships with you and and the likes of uh jimmy bangash you know zara k yasmin mohammed obeyed um so yeah yeah it's been a bit it's been a crazy kind of journey but i'm, I'm really pleased that i owe so much to you Aw, you're so sweet. I remember when Yasmin retweeted you or um, you messaged her or whatever and you sent me a message you're like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> like full oh. fangirl. So cute! Um, yeah. yeah, it made me um, really excited to see you flourish like that. Um, and that tangentially led you to be involved with the work at Free Hearts, Free Minds. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I, I've got quite a, a low-laying role, really, and I, 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 I don't know how much Yasmin would like me to speak about it. I, I don't know. Whatever Maybe you feel comfortable with. Think. Yeah, I, I am, um, so there, there's counseling that goes on through Free Hearts, Free Minds. Um, and so, you know, I do it, with, well, I don't do the counselling, but um, it's Yasmin Mohammed's organisation and it's aimed to, you know, help people in Muslim majority countries uh, who are leaving Islam or want to leave Islam. And so I, I have a, my role is to kind of moderate the website or, or make sure that nothing that shouldn't be happening is ha is happening so you know there may be fake accounts on there or pervy men that are using this as uh somewhere to prey on vulnerable women so yeah my job is just to kind of make sure everything is in check good good the protector i love it um and so you have been um you know trying to kip, kick up a little bit of dirt in your own uh, online activities so i'm pretty sure you got banned from tiktok or something i'm banned right now yeah they banned me <laughs> they banned me for like a week then i'll make a video and they'll ban me you know but, but twitter twitter's the best uh social media platform for me i think because twitter like doesn't censor anything you know I've never had anything taken down from Twitter. Um, I know that they are, they do kind of de-platform people though, that they do ban people. Um, Katie Hopkins has been banned. They're not letting Tommy Robinson on there. Uh, I, I don't know what American figures they, they've banned. Alex Jones. <laughs> Alex Jones. Um, I don't think I'm familiar with Alex Jones. Oh, um... Should I be? It sounds like I should be. Consider yourself lucky. I'll send you some choice videos later um he is oh uh, anyways <laughs> yeah he got deplatformed a long time ago um but one of the things you kind of mentioned earlier that's gotten maybe the most attention was you drawing the prophet muhammad yeah and um <laughs> what was that like that you're like this is what i'm doing today <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna film it. I'm gonna put it on Twitter. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just, I just thought that uh, drawing it and just uploading the picture—that's not enough. That's not gonna get people talking. Um, and you know, that I was inspired. <laughs> like, I'm I was looking for a reaction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, inspired, I was inspired by the the um, tragic Charlie Hebdo case, which I know happened. A while ago now in 2015 um but at the time i wasn't familiar with it 2015 i was probably still i was still a muslim so um i was just outraged at that and and then i learned about salman rushdie and the, the satanic verses and he had to go into hiding and uh, you know i just thought what the hell we can't draw something we, we're gonna get killed if we draw something um, and, you know, uh, 
my mom has just kind of raised me to be all about the truth. Just seek the truth and say what you want to say. Um, and, you know, Ricky Gervais kind of says as well, you know, offense is not given, it's taken, you know? So, um, and, and like I said, in that video of me drawing the, the prophet, I, I quoted Sam Harris and he, he brilliantly says, if your religion dictates that I must follow its rules, then that is not freedom of religion, that is theocracy. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I, and all the cases that you cover, like Mubarak Bala, and uh, there's a recent one today that I, I've put on my Instagram and Twitter, um, a young 22-year-old Nigerian singer who is now being sentenced. Uh, his name is Yuhaya Sharif uh, Amudi, some, Amuni. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about that, it on the podcast next week. Yeah, yeah. So it's cases like that uh, that made me think, right, I'm doing this. Um, and no, I didn't wake up one day and, and think we're going to do it. I thought about it for a few weeks and I ran it past some friends uh, who share the same kind of beliefs as me. And they said, mate, like, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And uh, everyone was telling me not to do it which obviously just added more fuel to the fire. Um, and it's interesting, I've spoken about this on another podcast. My two flatmates that I was living with at the time in London, uh, I've, now, I've now moved out as I'm going to Africa, but my two flatmates that I was living with, we, we were you know, great friends, we got on really well. Um, but they would consider themselves kind of on the left or certainly center left. And I told them that I'm gonna do it and their reaction was, what the fuck? You, you, why are you going to put our lives at risk? Like, Because I told them there will be a backlash, and I don't think anyone knows where we live. Um, but, you know, we may get death threats coming through the door or whatever. Um, and they said, why on earth are you putting our lives at risk? And, and you, you can understand that, kind of. But I, I pushed back and I said, well, hold on a minute, guys. Like, you're hypothetically here if we do get if i do get death threats there is a there is a, a perpetrator behind this death threat and then there is a victim you know me on the receiving end and you're pointing the finger at me not the person threatening to kill me how does that work um and they, they kind of came around and, and understood but we're still of the thought of like mate i'd rather you didn't be like i don't want to die and I said, to be honest, like these people dying, these people that are being killed for, for blasphemy, these people that are being killed for apostasy, that outweighs, you know, what you're saying to me. And, you know, it's for the greater good and uh, it has to be done. We have to normalize dissent and, and criticism. Yeah, I think I get a lot of feedback from people about, um, me going so hard <laughs> and um yeah it, it being so public about it and um i just think about how i mean there are risks right like we would be stupid if we didn't think that there were risks yeah. um being doxxed or threatened or whatever um but the threat to us is ultimately so little yeah yeah we live in the west you know whilst there are crazy nut job terrorists in the west um the law should and will um protect us well they can't protect us if someone actually does kill us but they, they, they would be on our side um we're not going to go to court for, for blasphemy um mm -hmm. yeah i think on that though it it's hard you know everyone's talking about white privilege I think the, the reason why, certainly a reason why I admire you so much and probably why a lot of people admire you so much is because oh. you haven't got the brown privilege that I and a lot of ex Muslims have got. You know, I, more often than not, when I get criticized for doing what I do, I don't get called a racist. I, I probably, I, well, I do get called an Islamophobe, whereas, I don't know, you, you can tell us, but, you know, being a, a white person, I can imagine people call you a racist and, and I think it's so much harder for you to um, 
criticize Islam than it is for me. And a lot of my white friends reply to my Instagram stories and say, totally agree with what you're saying. I just personally feel like I can't share this because I'll look like a racist. And you are like the, the, the spearhead and the, the queen um, of, you know, criticizing Islam within the white community. I don't like all this white community, black community, you know, we're all one human race, but um, it's really, it's really admirable what you do because, you know, you could be so easily targeted and, uh, but you, it just, I feel like it encourages you even more. Oh, thank you. I mean, I don't think I'm the queen, but I will accept the compliment. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of it comes from, um, yeah, kind of going back to being public about it is just like, I, I was tired of being a coward. I'll tell you that. Um, and tired of seeing other people have cowardice in the face of saying what is true, in the face of saying what harms millions of people. It's cowardice. And I would be, I would be betraying all of my friends. I would be betraying all of these leaders who have taught me everything that I know now if I supported them in silence. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm, I'm not going to support them in silence because they've been yelling at the top of their lungs for the past 10, 15 years longer about how this isn't going to change if more people, particularly who hold, you know, traditional liberalism as a value, they don't stand up and they um, don't say like, this is, this is wrong. And like I was saying, the threat to me is very minimal. The threat to me is, I mean, worst case scenario, doxing, worst case scenario, if someone physically assaults me. But it's, it, but really it's more like the threat is that people don't like me. Yeah. The threat is that people ostracize me or the threat is that people think that I'm off base with my criticism or they think that I'm perpetuating narratives of Western colonialism and I'm recolonizing these people by telling them that they should have human rights according to my standards. Like, God forbid. Um, and um, I just think it's ludicrous. I think it's hypocritical. And um, I... Yeah, I mean, people like Armin inspire me a lot. It's just like, I'm going to piss on your red lines. I'm going to piss on your red lines. If I think if, if the evidence leads me to believe that this is true, then I should not, like, feel shy from saying what I believe to be objectively true or have evidence to believe is objectively true. Yeah, I mean, we, we all know what, what right and wrong is, you know, unless you're like a psychopath. Um, you know, all of my friends, all of my kind of left-leaning friends, or it doesn't matter what kind of political uh, side you follow. Everybody knows that hitting your wife is wrong. Um, everybody knows that cutting the hands off of thieves is wrong. Everybody knows that being killed for leaving a religion is wrong. But they, they just can't, at the moment, like we all talk about Majid Nawaz coined the phrase the regressive left, they just can't make that step and say, okay, I'm out and I'm, I'm vocal about it. And like, <clears throat> I played a kind of trick on my Instagram followers um, a couple of months ago. <clears throat> I, um, I, well, it's not really a trick, but I, I, I put on my Instagram story uh, and I had about five or 600 viewers. I did a poll and I said, is a 53 year old man marrying a six year old girl, paedophilia, not a trick question. 97% of my followers voted uh, yes. I don't know who, I can't remember who that 3% were. I'm hoping they're trolling. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then my next story was the Prophet Muhammad married young Aisha at six years old. And I cited the um, hadith 
Um, and, you know, so many people were responding to me like, of course, why are you asking this? Of course, uh, a 53 year old man marrying a, a six year old girl is Peter Filio Obama. And they all voted yes. And then when I said, well, Prophet Muhammad married Aisha at six years old, like no one responded. No one wanted to speak about it. Uh, and I went and messaged people that voted yes. And I said, I, did, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to force people, but I said like, okay, so you know that those ages are that 53 and six, you know that's pedophilia. Why aren't you outraged by, you know, Prophet Muhammad? And they've got no, they've got no answer. It's, just, it's either like, oh, I've never thought about that. Or uh, a lot of people said that. A lot of people said, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm like, yeah. now you do know. So hello, like talk about it. Um, but yeah, the, they're so scared of looking like uh, a racist or an Islamophobe, and we need to find ways to normalize that. You know, um, we just have to keep going and, and hope that whatever time frame, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, people look back at our content, people look back at what we're saying and what we're doing, hopefully still in 20 years, and say, wow, Jesse and Susanna, like, they knew from the start. We, we were just a bit late catching on. Um, well, I'll speak for myself. I definitely didn't know from the start. Um, fucking, I was, I mean, you know, like, some of the, my antics. I was deeply regressive leftist. I will admit something terrible. When the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened originally, this is how bad I was. I was like, yeah, they should have expected that. Yeah. They, 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 they deserved it. I was, you know, there was like the Jesu Charlie, and then there yeah. was like the, I don't know French, so it's like Jesu no Charlie, whatever. So I, I was on the opposite train. That's how bad I was. And that belies my bigotry of low expectations that I believe that to be justifiable behavior from that group of people. That's bigoted. Um, yeah. And Thank God I learned my lesson. Yeah, um, so glad you did. It, it's the ordering of that sentence, isn't it? Because I think there was a, a French media outlet or newspaper company that said, they had a famous headline saying, um, it's really awful that these people were murdered, but they shouldn't have drawn that picture. And Douglas Murray has spoken about it brilliantly and, and said that, if you just change the order of that sentence round and you say, um, maybe they shouldn't have drawn that picture, but the murder was, you know, awful and we need to do something about it. And yeah, there was the movement, just sweet Charlie, and they went out on the streets. But as you've just said, there was opposition to that, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, we just need to find a way to make that step for everyone else. Yeah, um, it's so... Oh, there's so many different levels of like stuff I used to believe and say that is just so cringy. I don't even have words. Like for example, I used to, um, uh, I remember giving a presentation in my psychology of sexuality class about female genital mutilation and explicitly making the distinction that I'm calling it female genital cutting. Because if I call it mutilation, then I am putting, I am inserting my dominant narrative as a Western person and judging them for their culture, thereby replicating ex colonialism. It's insane. No, it's mutilation. Like, and I can say that openly. I now, um, but well, ah, oh, man, college was. A, craziness critical theory fucked my brain but that's a whole different conversation um so oh there's so much i want to talk to you about so you're very passionate about finding fgm in particular yeah and um a lot of other traditions from various cultures that um generally harm women it's something we talk about a lot yeah. and um what how, how, what do you want to do with that moving forward? It's, um, <clears throat> it's tough. And I've had several conversations recently with people in person um, uh, where they're, they're, people are kind of telling me, why, why do you think you can go and change FGM? And I'm like, it, what, it needs an explanation? What the hell? Um, 
but I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm, I'm going to Africa in, on Saturday. I'm, I'm, I'm moving, I've got a one-way ticket, and I'm going to Malawi, and Malawi doesn't actually have a high prevalence of FGM compared to other countries like Nigeria, Somalia, and stuff like that. Um, but it does happen. Um, and there are other forms of kind of what I call torture to women. I, I've recently learned that literally in the village that I'm going to be going to in Malawi, uh, people put hot eggs inside the vaginas of nine-year-old girls to desensitize them to sex. So, so my, I've taken that as, right, that's just another form of FGM. It's not mutilating or cutting, but it's like it, they're doing it for the same reasons. And um, I don't know how I'm going to tackle it because, you know, I'm not, I'm not some sort of raging bull, but if I find myself, you know, face to face with somebody who cuts young girls' vaginas, I don't, I, I, maybe I need to be careful about what I want to say, what I want to say here, but I don't know. I, I, I'm going to need to take some like lessons in, you know, holding back. Um, I totally know and understand that it's a, uh, it's an ideological war. It's not, um, it's not a, I want to say it's not a physical war, but I mean, have you seen the movie, um, Machine Gun Preacher? No. Oh my God. It's incredible. Um, it's based on a true story. It's a guy called Sam Childers and in the movie it's played by, uh, Gerard Butler. It, it's incredible because it's a totally true story. He's a real guy. I'll, I'll, I'll save the whole backstory, but basically he went to Northern Uganda and like uh, South Sudan when Joseph Kony was running around killing loads of people and uh, abducting loads of children and cutting the lips off of children and making young kids kill their mums, you know, and turning them into child soldiers. And he tried to build a church and, uh, you know, take kids into the orphanage. And then the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, the, the, the arseholes, they would just go around, you know, d burning down his church and shooting everyone. So Sam Childers, who's a, he's from Pennsylvania, he was a hillbilly. He was just like, fuck this. I am picking up my gun and I'm going to shoot you back. Um, and he gets a lot of criticism. People call him a murderer and whatnot, but he has saved so many kids. And he, he brilliantly says, if your child got abducted and turned into a sex slave or a, a child soldier, if your child got abducted and I told you I could get your child back, are you going to question me how I do that? You're not. You're, you're fucking not. So, um... You know, I believe that you can fight violence with violence. And this is not me saying I'm going to Africa and I'm going to go kill loads of people who, who practice FGM. Um, but, you know, something has to be done. We, we can't just keep talking about it. The, the, the talking is great and, and raising awareness is great. And there are loads of uh, online pages and there are loads of organizations who are doing work, not just online. Um, but... I'm me and I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to go on the front line as it were. And, uh, I'm, you know, I will try and help through education and I want to bring, uh, people over and I want to educate people. I'm no expert on FGM and the, and the procedure and I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I've spoken to NHS doctors who, have, well, you, you, don't, you don't need to hear it from a doctor. Um, but or you, you can go on the NHS website, you can go on the WHO website and, and it, you know, it's common knowledge that it serves no health benefits. It is purely done to um, desensitize women to sex uh, and make them less horny. So, yeah, I am of the belief that like shit needs to get done, and and I'm going to do it. And I want to I want to build an army uh, as such uh, of people that want to help me as well. Two hundred million women or females alive today have undergone FGM. It, it, like, it breaks my heart. I, I can't believe that it's not spoken about more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, 
If uh, anyone fucks up your pretty face while you're fighting FGM on putting a fatwa on their head. Um, <laughs> so, well, it's kind of interesting. So what do you think about male circumcision? It's interesting. Um, I was circumcised myself when I was three weeks old. Um, Male circumcision is nowhere near as bad as female circumcision, period. Um, so, like, like, okay, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, but I have spoken to NHS doctors and, and I'm sure there are articles that, I, that we could find. Um, FGM on a woman would be the equivalent of, we all know what a penis looks like, would be the equivalent of chopping off the head of a penis, you know, the what we call in England the bell end. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not appropriate, but um, it simply is not the same, uh, you know. So, however, I, I do think it's wrong, um, and and that's somebody who's been circumcised. And although we're told, and I've even said to people that it's cleaner to be circumcised. Um, I think it's wrong. Yeah, I, I, you know, we don't chop fingers off because they don't look right or what. I, I think it's wrong. But yeah, I'm not vocal on male circumcision. Um, uh, I just see FGM as much more of a problem, and I put my energy into that. But maybe I, you know, maybe I'm guilty of, of not giving this kind of enough attention which you know i'll look into um yeah what, what I, mean, you... I think it's fair like we all have to be selective in our attention right like we can't have our activism touch on literally everything that's not effective it doesn't get anything done and people need to build areas of expertise right yeah. however i agree that fgm is unequivocally worse on an individual basis but the amount of pain and suffering that male genital mutilation has caused is undoubtedly larger just in terms of how many people have suffered from male genital mutilation it's it's the, the numbers over time over history are so much larger um but on the individual level the uh, the health effects the the pain i mean the pain for an infant going through this is the same as an adult going through this. So we just hopefully have the benefit of infantile amnesia to not remember that pain. But um, I, 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 I rail equally as hard against both of them. Um, I think male genital mutilation needs to be globally banned um, unequivocally. And um, I, I, I'm right now I'm currently looking for anyone trying to pass legislation around it um, because I think it's it's wrong it's there's only very very rare cases in which it is medically necessary yeah. and it's not actually cleaner I mean we don't cut off our fingertips because they're dirty right we clean them um, yeah yeah I think um, yes yeah, so I said it's cleaner didn't I I'm, I think, you know, when you're, 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 when you're a boy, you, especially when you play football or you're in change rooms with boys, you see other guys' penises. You, you, you shower together in football teams and whatnot. Um, and, uh, you know, sleepovers with friends and whatever. A lot of guys that I know, a lot of my friends who have foreskin, uh, don't pull it back when they wee, when they urinate. Um, and that, again, I'm no doctor, but I'm sure that that would make it dirtier than if they were to pull their foreskin back. Um, but all of this is subjective and, you know, uh, so that was the basis behind me saying it, it's cleaner. Um, but yeah, I'm no expert and I think it's wrong and I think, think it should be, I agree with you, it should be eradicated. Um, I, I just think the the pain and uh, what women are going through is is more important, and 
more deserved of uh, activism work. That's fair. I mean, I agree on an individual, on an individual level, um, the pain and damage is far greater. Um, on aggregate, on aggregate, I think there's been more suffering from male genital mutilation. Um, yeah. And we have religion to thank for it. Yeah. That's the only reason why we do it and it's normalized. Um, yeah. Well, I think with, I think with FGM, um, God, you'd think I'd be an expert on it, but I'm not. Um, it, FGM is pre-Islamic. Um, so, you know, it was happening before Islam came along, but I think there's, it's either in the Hadith or the Quran, I think it's in the Hadith where a young girl, not Aisha, uh, asks the Prophet Muhammad, um, should I get myself cut? And he doesn't say yes, but he says something along the lines of, well, it wouldn't be a bad idea, or it would be cleaner if you did. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that FGM almost exclusively happens in Muslim-majority countries. You know, the statistics are, like, terrifying. I think it's 97% of married Egyptian women in Egypt have gone through FGM. Somalia is like 98 or 99 percent. Um, it's it's incredible the numbers. Um, like I said, 200 million women and children worldwide today. Uh, that's not like over you know it's today. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, it it does come from the hadith. I can't find my notes on it right now, but it depends on you know your school of thought and school of jurisprudence but like some consider it mandatory some just consider it recommended um it yeah it's oh my god it's so terrible um i want to shift a little bit and i want to talk to you about islamic reform yeah because so i was watching your interview i think the channel is called ex muslim uk and um, so I was watching your interview with them, and you said that there are parts of Islam that need to be revisited, and we need to tackle the problems in Islam. Specifically, wait, let me find the quote. <laughs> you said, Islam needs reforming. It needs completely changing. And I want to ask you, should we reform Islam or should we abandon Islam? <laughs> if, this is a, it's a really hard question. If we take out, and, and you could talk about how likely this is or whatever but if we take out all the bad things all the violent things all the instructions to kill because there are good things in the quran obviously as there are good things in the bible then i feel like it would be okay You can, you can see I'm, I'm struggling with this. No. It's a really hard one. You know, some days I, I you know, I hate Islam. I, I've got no, uh, I hate Islam because, you know, it is what it is. You, all you have to do is read the Quran. And, and, you know, but I, I, uh, I think I, I've likened it to Donald Trump in the past where I'm not expressing my opinion on Donald Trump here, but um, people hate Donald Trump, right? A lot of people hate Donald Trump. A lot of people like him. But, and there are some people who would like to see Donald Trump killed, and I would call those people kind of terrorist -y psychopaths. Um, but a lot of people don't like him because of what he does and what he stands for, and they want to see that presidency changed. Um, either if it was him who just came out and said, right, all of that crazy stuff you think I said, I take that all back. I'm going to now do this, 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 and that. Or if the actual president changed and someone else went in power, then people would be happy. They don't necessarily want to see him, uh, you know, exterminated or killed. So 
I, I don't think we need to kill off Islam. Um, I mean, you mm. used the word abandon. Um, I don't know if you were careful with your selection of that word abandon or if it's, you like, um, I don't think we need to kill off Islam. I, I think we need to change it because it's so cultural, it's so ingrained in culture for 1400 years. Um, so I almost feel like it would take another 1400 years to, to reform it um, or, or get rid of it. Um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know, I'm so, every day is a new thought on, on that question. What, what do you think? I think I need, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you on some things right here. Um, so if, but another thing you said in the interview was like kind of what you said, like if Islam starts giving us what we want from a religion, it wouldn't be so bad. But to me, the question is, what do we want from a religion? So I think all religions need to be abandoned flatly. It doesn't matter how peaceful or how good certain doctrines, certain verses, certain traditions are. They need to be abandoned because they are not true. And you were saying, seek and speak the truth. Even if there were no bad things in Islam, it still would not be true. And to me, there is no such thing as a harmless falsehood. And so even if there was some religion somewhere or some spirituality that somehow raised children and people to be completely peaceful like these little amazing humans, um, but it was still not based in empiricism, rationality. I would still be completely opposed to it because there is no such thing as a harmless falsehood. And so even if we somehow took all the bad things out of Islam, I consider the good things in religion to be bad things as well because they um, draw people in to an ideology that is ultimately false and a method of seeking truth that is ultimately flawed. Um, that's harmful. And what I'm concerned about is the methodology and the epistemology that people use to establish what they believe is true and what they believe is objective reality. And so, like, I, even if everything was magically fine or not harmful, it still would be teaching people a methodology that is flawed on how to understand the universe that they're in. And they will not have the tools to go about further, um, They'll be, they'll be working off of a flawed methodology, and that flawed methodology will inevitably lead them to believe more harmful things that are not true. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I've been on a, a, a journey with my atheism, never once doubted my atheism, never, you know, but uh, about three or four months ago, I. You, you could have called me an anti-theist. I, I even called myself an anti-theist on one Instagram story. And I hated all religion and I hated the idea of God. And now I haven't become less of an atheist at all. I've just kind of calmed down a bit. And, <laughs> um, and I, I think I am trying to come up come at it from a, a realistic point of view as well so I don't think it's possible to we as humans and I'm no biologist but we as humans are pattern seeking animals we are knowledge seeking animals we would rather have a theory than no theory so if you get rid of religion 
sooner or later, over whatever kind of time frame, be it a, a decade or a month or, or year or whatever, people are going to find something else that's crazy to believe in. And but Jesse, we have a theory, and that theory is the scientific method. Yeah, and I'm totally with it. It. I think aiming to destroy religion will cause more harm than aiming to reform religion. I think if you go into someone's house and say, well, I don't know. I guess you could imagine the type of analogy I was going for there. If you go into someone's house and say, you're never allowed to eat that chocolate again, why not? You're just not. You know, um, they're going to not like that. But if you say, if you come at them and you're like, if you eat less of this chocolate, the world is going to be a better place. These people aren't going to be killed, blah, 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 blah. If we just change the way you consume this chocolate, everyone will be better off. Um, and I mean, that's a, that's probably a shit analogy, but I, I just think it will do a lot of harm trying to take it away. Um, well, let me be clear about something. So I, um, don't believe in, or I'm not a proponent of reforming any religion because it is still not true. And even if you have a nicer version, it is still not true. And I'm not going to have the bigotry of low expectations that certain groups of people are not capable of understanding the same truth and the same lines of evidence that I am. Right? So kind of, and I'm not saying you're making this argument, but other make, people make this argument that it's like, oh, well, we need to wean them off of it. You know, like they're not ready for the truth yet. And I think that's kind of insulting. Um, and the, the, the comparison you made to Trump, it's like, oh, well, people want him changed as a person. That, that's, that's not a good comparison because ideologies are either supported in objective reality, testable, replicable, they stand under scrutiny, or they don't. They're either true or they're not true. Or versus people are fallible and people can change. I, I am an infinite believer in the possibility for people to change. And so, I, I don't think it's a fair comparison to make like, oh, there's this person that we don't like and they can change. So these ideologies can change too. Sure, they can change, but whether or not they are objectively true or not will not change. They either are or they are not. So, okay, so the truth argument, uh, you know, we learn about things that aren't true, but we still are able to dismiss them. So Harry Potter, we all know it's not true, but we we accept it. And I, I know it's very different because it's like people aren't following Harry Potter religiously and killing in the name of it. But, you know, and, and I'm definitely not defending that, you know, those freaks who kill in the name of religion and whatnot, you know, that needs to be stopped. But I think we could have we can have a thing or an ideology that's not true and and still live side by side with it. We we know the truth and we're not following it and we know that snakes can't talk and we know that you know Muhammad a, a human can't fly to the moon on a winged horse and cut the moon in half. We know that but I'm kind of of the belief that like Believe what you want to believe, but like, you know, there are rules in this world that we live in and you can't kill someone and you, you can't chop the hands off a, of, of a thief. I don't know if it's possible to reform Islam, but I think it's more possible than 
eradicating it? I think it is possible to reform people and reform cultures. Yeah. So I don't believe in Islamic reform or Christian reform, etc. Because it's still an ideology that would be false. I do believe in Christians reforming. I do believe in Muslims as people reforming. I don't believe in reforming a false ideology into being slightly less harmful because it's still false. But I do believe in reforming cultures and people. So that's one thing I think kind of that's what you're getting at. And so that's one thing I will agree with you on is like, that's what I work towards. Um, We changing the culture around it, but trying to say, Oh, Surah 434, it doesn't really say hit your wife. It says, like, do this thing with grapes or whatever. That's, like, how people try to retranslate it or whatever. That's, yeah. that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. And it, it, it would be more difficult to convince people that what this clearly says in Arabic, it doesn't say what you're reading, versus um, just saying this should be rejected outright because it does not meet our standards of evidence and yeah or rejected culturally but would it be easier to so we both agree that well tell me what you think but i feel like we both agree that eradicating religion is unfathomably hard right Uh, like yeah yeah (laughs) So wouldn't it be, and we, we both agree that we, you know, I agree with you, we, we need to be reforming people um, and, and cultures, but wouldn't it be easier if we reformed the religion, stake Islam, and, and then over a long period of time, you'd have a massive net win because you wouldn't have to reform all those people every day, every year, over generations, because the whole religion would be reformed. So then... You know, you have kids being born and, and there won't be verse, you know, chapter 4, 34, hitting it. We'll just take it out. We'll just take that whole hitting your wife out. So then, like, you won't have to keep reforming people. You'll, you'll, the ideology will be harmless um, or a lot less harmful than, than it is. It, it would be maybe less harmful, but it would still be harmful because it's not true. And you're teaching people to believe things that are not true. I'm against that. I'm, I'm, I'm against that. I'm an atheist. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I'm pressing you on it. Because it's like, why hold other people to a lesser standard than you hold yourself? Well, I've seen good things happen through religion. Um, Then there's the argument, those good things could be done without religion also. Um, But, you know, my sister, for example, uh, well, this is a, I don't know, I don't think she likes me talking about her, but she's a born again Christian in the last sort of five years. And she does a lot of good work in Africa and Ghana, and she helps people, she helps get, uh, drug addicts on the right path and I've seen that with my own eyes so I yeah. think that happens because she's a good person that happens because she's a good person that doesn't happen because yeah. of religion she would argue that it's God telling her to do this and it's God's work I agree with you but if you take religion away from her and take God away from her Although she's a good person, she might not then do these things and help hundreds of people. So, uh, and I also think, I don't know if this is going off topic here, but I was on Zara Kay's podcast and Zara is a good friend of mine. Um, we disagreed. You're probably more of the same belief as Zara and not me. Z- Zara said she hates all religion. She hates Christianity as much as she hates Islam. And I strongly disagree with that. Um, not because I'm some sort of Christian apologist uh, and not because I've got Christian friends and family. I, uh, now on Twitter, I criticize Islam way more than Christianity. 
But over the years and on Instagram and stuff, I've criticized Christianity heavily. I've done, I've made videos of me holding the Bible and, you know, Leviticus. But um, Christianity is nowhere near as bad as Islam. You know, and I, I think we all know um, that constantly or consistently killing in the name of your religion is unique to Islam today. And Christianity is nowhere near as worse as Islam. There are bad things in the Bible, like I said, Leviticus, um, you know, where, where it says, if a man lays with another man, he should be put to death. And so I argue that to Christians and I say, all right, well, you know, if somebody walks into a library and buys that and reads that, and they don't get any further to when Jesus came and Jesus spread his message, they're going to think they have to go and kill homosexuals. But then I think you probably know a lot more about Christianity than me and the Bible than I do, but the message I get from my Christian friends is, well, no, Jesus came and Jesus rebelled against, you know, all of that stuff. Jesus rebelled against the law and he said, you know, he who has no sin cast the first stone. Um, when people were about to, you know, basically kill this prostitute. Um, so uh, this may look like I'm being a Christian apologist here. I'm absolutely not. I'm just making the case that, you know, Christianity is nowhere near as bad as Islam, and Christianity needs reforming, in my opinion. But there are a lot of examples of good work being done through Christianity. Um, I, get I think that happens despite Christianity. <laughs> I agree, but but would it be done if these people weren't Christians? Like my sister, for example, she wouldn't be doing the stuff she's doing and helping kids in Ghana if she hadn't found Jesus. I don't know if it's fair for me to say that, but... I don't know if that's necessarily true. It might, maybe it would have happened a different way. But, oh my goodness, what was my I'm point? Like I, so here's the difference for me. Here's the difference for me. Islam is definitely the most dangerous. We agree yeah. on that. Today, definitely the most dangerous. Um, but they are all equally as false. Yes, yes. Agreed. And so that's, that's why I oppose all of them. Because they are all false. I oppose all of them too. I'm with you there. So yeah. I'll continue, I'll no, I'm not saying that you're not opposing it, but like that means that I'm also not supporting reform because it is still as false. It might not be as dangerous, but it is still dangerous because it is false. So, okay, so you, you support the reform of people and say... And culture. Common. Yeah because they can change. So it's worth like investing the time in trying to reform a person because we know that they can change. Um, you and I are living proof of that. We, we were here and now we're here. Um, so does that mean, so do you think an ideology can't change? What if literally? The ideology can change but if it is true or not true, that doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't change. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, but I don't think we have to cancel everything that's not true. I think we should learn about it. And I'm not accusing you of cancel culture. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think because something is false, we have to, eradicate it. This is what I wanted to challenge you on. And I mean, part of me is hoping I change your mind, but you don't have to. We're still friends. Um, well, I, know I just thought that was a little inconsistent in a way because your, your banner on Twitter is literally like, so you can speak the truth. But yeah, but yeah, it is. And I, yeah, it is. See, can see, see, can speak the truth, but that doesn't mean eradicate things that aren't the truth learn about them and say all right that is not true that that is what you don't follow son you know um but that's not what reform is because islamic reform still maintains the belief 
Yeah, but if people are believing something and not harming people or, you know, just going about their everyday life, uh, what's wrong with that? We, you know, what's wrong is that they will be operating off of a methodology that is flawed and that is not true and based in truth, reality, empiricism, rationalism. And invariably, even if they're given something right now, right here, that's false, but it's not harmful, maybe in an objective way, they will be using this flawed way of getting to their answer of what they think is true. And they will be presented with something that will cause them harm at one point because they're working off of a flawed epistemology. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I think, you know, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm an atheist. I, I think the idea of a God and a, a, a designer, you know, and a heaven and a hell is it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's so ridiculous to me. Um, I just think, it, just think, maybe we, we can't get rid of religion. Uh, yeah. People are always going to find something like it. You know, it might be called a different thing in a thousand years' time, but it will still be, people will still identify in certain groups of strange things. Um, Yeah. I get what your point is. And to be fair, like I fight against all dogma. All dogma. It doesn't have to be a religious dogma. Um oh my gosh, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, but we've been talking for like so long now. Um so I think we should wrap it up. Um so uh you can follow Jesse on Twitter. Do you want me to plug your Instagram? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Links in the description. Um, you can also learn more about free hearts, free minds, which is really cool. Uh, gotta get that plug in. Uh, also link in the description. So yeah. Thanks for joining me, Jesse. Thanks so much for having me. I've had so much fun. We should do it again. You know. I know. Right. Uh, I love my friends. Okay. Uh, and stop. <laughs>